All right, welcome to another episode of the Keep It or Change Cars podcast. My name is Gugu Masuku. I'm your host, and I'm joined by my partner in crime, Michael Pashutz. Episode 256, 257. 270, whatever you want <laughs> I it love to love it. Right? We're also joined by Spike Ballantyne. So you may have heard about Spike Ballantyne when we were doing the podcast. He's always behind the scenes, but he's a man with a story, um, a man who's been in the motoring industry for many, many, many years. So we thought we'd get him into the studio here and just chat to him about his career, what he's doing, how he got into it. He used to have a TV show, just by the way. So you may recognize the face when you do see him. Spike, welcome. Thank you, gents. Good to be here. Good to have you. Thank you. So let's chat. Who is Spike Ballantyne or Brendan Ballantyne, for those who don't know? Oh, yeah. So that's that's one point of confusion. I do answer to both. <laughs> so uh, my mother was quite upset when she saw Spike on TV for the first time. She was like, what's wrong with your real name? But, yeah. uh, so yeah, it was. What is your real name? You got another name I've besides got, Spike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> um, so yeah, I started on on. Uh, I got into motoring um, in about 2005. I started with what was called Top Car Magazine back in the day. Um, I had been working in radio for a long time before then, and I decided I wanted something different. And I loved cars, and so I, I kind of put a, a demo together with the car I was driving at the time, which was uh, an Audi S3. Um, the, Another Audi fan? Yeah, yeah, through and through. Always welcome on the show. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I, I, I put an audition together with that and um, landed a, a, a gig with um, with Top Car Magazine as part of their TV show that they had on Supersport. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of where it started. Do you have any TV background back then? I know you, you, you did radio. Yeah, no, I had zero. I had nothing. Uh, oh, so I just, you just winged it? Yeah, I just I kind of put a, a screen test together. I, I did a review of my own car at the time and gave it. I actually handed it out to, I think, two or three TV shows that were doing the rounds at that time. Mm -hmm. One was on SABC and then, then the other one was, the, you know, the, the more well-known one was Top Car Magazine. This is a very special moment for me. I'm looking at Spike and I'm seeing June 2022 in my vision. You said, did you have any TV experience? No, I just oh, did it like June this. June 2022. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> made my first uh, appearance on TV June 2022 yes. yeah. at 2.35 p.m. on June the 18th. <laughs> really? It's kind of yeah. in my memory. I'm joking yeah. that I'm making up. That's the thing. It's like it, it, everyone's like, oh, you had no experience, but it's really Really not that difficult yeah. if you can stand up and have a conversation sure. with someone it's easy enough look it is difficult because i remember i was there before you were there you had to see all of it uh, yeah i was there at the genesis of your tv story as well like, oh. <laughs> it was bad eh? it was, there were a few struggles let's put it that way yeah i know it was bad but we we grow and we get there <laughs> and i think everybody's got a different style the three mm. of us we've yeah. got a different style but what would you say spike gugu in your opinion is a key to being on tv being on radio doing a podcast like this it's all the same what is a key for you i think that's the standout thing no matter what form you're in is authenticity you have 100%. to be real you can't you can't say the same you know it's it's for a long time um you know there was a, a thing that you know when clarkson was around and top gear was around everyone kind of wanted to be the next clarkson and the next top gear and it's you can't do that because they're, they've done it. they're already there they're and no one's going to do it better than they are or they did and so you know whatever you're doing just do it authentically you know use your own voice use your own words take your own approach on things and, and my thing was never you know, I, the gap that I saw as far as I could see it back when I was in TV was that there was, you know, there was kind of the reviews were sort of very uh, up and down. You know, there was no real kind of storytelling or insight or creativity around it. They were like, this is the car. This is how fast it goes. This is the 0 to 100. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. And so I try to kind of weave a bit of storytelling into all the reviews that I did. And that was the gap that I saw. And it was kind of always my take on, you know, the cars that I was doing. And, you know, that authenticity sometimes got me to trouble. People didn't like what I said sometimes, which which is always fine. We, you know, it just means that they're watching and listening to what you're saying. And people ask for forgiveness. Some people ask for permission. Yeah. Sounds like you ask for a lot of forgiveness. Asked, yeah, exactly. I got, I got a lot of hate emails from uh, Passat owners in particular, actually. Really? What yeah. Is, what, is, what is a Passat? Yeah, it's a very boring Volkswagen. Oh, interesting. I know we're going off on a tangent, <laughs> but if there's one name, again, the product, funny enough, I thought the VW Passat as a product throughout oh. the years mm. was an excellent car. Phenomenal. I've always loved it. It's 100%. Gr it's a great car. But the name, just with all due respect to whoever came up with that name, that was mm. a cuck name. Yeah. And that's the thing Ooh. about the Passat itself. If you look at it on paper, it's Excellent a, car. It's a mm. great car. Great value for money. But, wow, it's boring to drive. It just, yeah, oh, really, sure. really unexciting car to drive. And uh, yeah, people didn't like that, so. Ah. <laughs> and yourself, Google, I asked Spike, what for you is it about being on TV? What is a key ingredient? I think, like you said, authenticity. Um, yeah, just 
just being you, because I, I see a lot of people, like Spike said, you, they, they come on there and they try to be something. When you're trying to be something, it really doesn't, it mm -hmm. doesn't resonate with anyone. Yeah. Right? Sure. And I think that, that, that applies for TV, that applies for radio, that applies for podcasting. I've done all of them. Just be you. I mean, I got onto Cliff Central. Um, Spike knows we work together. And I was only meant to be a technical producer for the show. I got thrown in the deep end the one time and spoke and spoke authentically. I didn't care what they thought. Next thing you know, it was like, we want more of that guy. Uh, for yeah. sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Then I ended up being on the show. Mm. One of the things that stuck with me, 1991, Michael Schumacher makes his debut. And everybody was saying, yeah, he's the next Ayrton Senna. And Michael said in his very German accent, I am not the next Ayrton Senna. I am the Michael Schumacher. <laughs> and that's the go. truth. Be yourself. Yeah. And that, and that always important. stuck with me. Yeah. People must be able to relate to you. Yeah. But you've got a really interesting story. I mean, we talk about going back 18 years. Is there anything that you haven't done? Um, not yet. Not yet, no. <laughs> no, there's, I mean, in, in, a, in a motoring sense, there's, there's lots that I want to do now. Uh, I've kind of moved away. When I was doing the TV thing and, and I had my own podcast for a short time, um, that just became too much work for me because I was trying to do everything myself. So it was, just became too much of a workload and then I, kind of, I had to give that up. But in it's clever. Mm -hmm. Can't do the podcast. I'll just manage it. Let Google yeah, and I yeah, do yeah. the work. Yeah, let them do the hard work. <laughs> yeah. and I'll just sit the back going, I'll try that again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of merging, there's, there's lots of stuff I'd love to still do. I mean, I, I've, I've really got now kind of a, a passion for, you know, fixer upper projects or kind of restoration product projects. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to take an old car and fix it up, but not to, not for any other reason than just to restore it to its former glory. Doing it yourself or yeah, filming doing, it, watching no, uh, I, I, doing do it, it? Doing it, my, doing it myself as far as I can. I think there's, there's limitations to what you can do as a, as a newbie. You know, you got, you got to go realize that there are things that maybe you, you should leave up to the professionals. But the other thing is I've realized is there is so much knowledge out there that there really Correct. isn't a, there probably isn't a problem you can't tackle yourself with the right amount of training of, of yourself. You know, if you watch enough YouTube Hello, videos, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, if you not you know Google stuff, you speak to people, you go to forums, you'll learn a lot. I think yeah. the, the 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 problem is finding the right tools and the space to do it in. But uh, yeah, I would love to restore an old car. I would love to do. I mean, I, I know I know it's a touchy subject, so I don't really want to bring it up. <laughs> Alpha. No, 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 not that touchy. No, no, not that touchy. <laughs> not that. No, I'd really have to do an EV conversion. Like my first, my very first car was a 1400 Bucky, a Datsun 1400 Bucky. Ah. And I love that car. And I, to this day, I would love to get an old 1400 Bucky and do an EV conversion because I think it's the right platform to do in it. In 1975, on. when the Datsun 120Y came out, because before it was a 1400, yeah, it was it a was 1200. A yeah. I can just see the designers of that Bucky saying, one day, 50 years from now, somebody will turn this into an electric vehicle. <laughs> Not. <laughs> but but right. it's, what's so interesting you said about the knowledge out there. So a week ago, I was in Peter Maritzburg for Cars in the Park. There's a gentleman who restores motorbikes. Old motorbikes. When I say old, not vintage 40s or 50s, mm. but 1980s motorbikes. He had the most beautiful Yamaha and Honda there. You look at it. If I say to you, Gugu, Spike, they looked 100% original. Then he talked us through. He said, you see this uh, brake grip? You see this clutch? Obviously, should look the same. This one broke. Try find a clutch, a, a clutch for, an, you know, the clutch handle mm. for 1981 bike. Impossible. He machines it on a lathe, polishes it, cuts it, joins it. Yeah. The expertise absolutely yeah. is out there. And I think the amazing thing is we, if you look for things that you particularly want to do that you may not have seen before, you'll find answers to it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in, you know, being able to machine or create new interior parts out of plastic. And I've seen videos of guys who have 3D printed 3D entire printing. dashboards mm. and yeah. entire center consoles and new switches and new buttons. Mm. And it looks amazing. And, you know, that kind of stuff is being done. The knowledge is out there. The technology is there. So, there's the, you know, that's that's kind of my impetus to get it done is like it is completely possible so would you say that's that's that could be one possible way i mean parts are expensive car parts are expensive i saw that with bike parts recently yes. mm -hmm. as would you say 3d printing would be cheaper or more affordable i think for certain things yes mm. uh i think the the question is is it more affordable probably but is it fit for purpose that's the one question the other question is does it look as good as the original ah. you know because 3d printing has got its uh, it's got its limitations in terms of final finish mm. so it's probably not going to look as good as an injection molded what what but you know to to have a, a part there that that does a job and looks the part it may not look 100 percent authentic but i think it's it's a viable alternative so one of the things about this podcast is for our audience to learn and trust me i'm learning 
I've got a Lancia Monte Carlo, mm. 1982. Very neat condition. You've seen it. But there's certain vents that are missing. And everybody talks about no problem. There are guys that will do you 3D printing. Mm. With God as my witness, until I heard it, I didn't know it existed. Mm. What exactly is 3D printing? Teach me, teach our audience. So 3D printing is essentially the, the kind of kind of the name says it. You use a, a, a filament, a plastic filament, and they're different grades and different kinds of plastic depending on the application. Uh, and essentially, it's a machine that builds up the part off uh, off a 3D um, graphic image yeah, 3D, right. that you create. So you'll use a program like uh, Fusion 360 or SketchUp or whatever it is, and you will create that part or that uh, that object in 3D um, with measurements, with tolerances, with everything you need. Uh, and then you will send that file to the 3D printer and that 3D printer will realize that part in, in reality. It's a very simplified way of describing what it does, but that's essentially what it does. Do you prefer EFT or credit card when I do the payment? Because I can't do this myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, EFT is always better. But Thank yeah, the, the, that's the thing. It, it's, you know, there are people who will be able to do it. And I guarantee you, you spend some time, enough time on the internet, you'll find someone who will, mm. you know, if they don't, if they don't, if they aren't able to print the part for you, will be able to, you know, point you in the right direction. And my favorite are guys who go, no, I've got this part, but I can't give it to you. But then someone else will scan that, will do a 3D scan of that part. And then you can import, refine it, and wow. then print your own version. And there's lots of it being done. That's insane. Yeah. Want SA's leading insurance? Visit changecars.co.za and click on the discovery logo. Okay, Spike, so you spoke about what you'd like to do in the future, put batteries in a old Datsun, whatever. Not um, whatever. What is it? What it's is a 40 it? 40 40 40 40 the champion of Africa. I wasn't there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> is it the champion? The, the, yeah. So they, they used to have a 1400 champ, a yeah. 1400 sport, yeah. 1400 okay, deluxe. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. I promise you, when I look back, because oh. remember, I've often said it, I started in 1991. When I look back 30 years ago, without lying, we had Dats and Buckies from the 70s and early 80s, Nissans from the mid 80s, and they were like a dime a dozen. Mm. Like you'd buy a Polo today as a motor dealer. You buy five, six, seven Polos, four Hiluxes, three Fortunas a month because they're good sellers. That's how we used to buy Nissan 1400s. Mm. These things always used to fly out. Mm. How tall are you, Spike? I'm 173. Designed for you. How mm. tall are you? 181, 182. Not even remotely designed for <laughs> you. <laughs> at 178, 179, okay, you will just fit in there. But at 180 plus, I promise you, your head, no matter what position you sit in the seat. Mm. And when I say sit, because the seat's not adjustable. Am I correct? Like the, 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 the champ, the later ones did have. So you had eventually. Oh, excuse had, me. What had, kind of adjustment? Like, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, you no, know, they're really tight. But there was, there was the one with the bench seat, which wasn't yeah. adjustable. Right. And then the other, they had the individual seats, which were marginally adjustable. That's right. But there were, there were the two, ones that had two seats. Yeah. And then it had like a square headrest yep. with marginal. That, that's true. Mm. Up to one, set, one meter 79, you yeah. were uncomfortable. Okay. So <laughs> the question for you that I had before you digressed and went on to one now to 185, 176. All the technical stuff. All the There's stuff. one thing we don't know yet. What? How tall are you? Yeah, how tall are you? 182. Okay, there we okay. go. Right, now we can carry on. Unco uncomfortable <laughs> is a <the> verdict. <laughs> so you, you and I have spoken and you've spoken about how the, the, the industry killed your passion for cars at mm. some point. Yeah. Tell me about that. So I think when you when you, this is the one thing that that I that I learned a lesson I learned over time, and it wasn't just because of motoring. It was it was because of of other work that I was involved in, and is that you know it's all well and good to follow your passion, and it's it's amazing if you can get to the point where your work is your passion, um, but eventually it has to pay the bills. Like your passion is not going to pay bills. Um, and I think that's what I mean is that eventually it became a job rather than a passion because I was, I was working really hard to try and just, so to, to give you a bit of context, when I went from radio to TV, my salary dropped by 50%. So I'd kind of built up this lifestyle and got used to it and then, you know, dropped by 50%. And then, you know, we were, the show that we had was, was it lived by the, by the grace of sponsors. So when sponsors like fell by the wayside, then we had to struggle to find you know, another sponsor or sponsors cut budgets or, and eventually it got to the point where there just wasn't, you know, there was no one was willing to sponsor the show. Change cars wasn't around at that time. Way uh -huh. before, <laughs> way before. Uh, and that's the thing. It just became, it became this thing of, of, you know, yeah, you were doing this work and, and we were, you know, we were traveling a lot. I saw a lot of the world, I, you know, because of the show, I drove amazing cars. We're going to get uh, into that just now. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but it got to the point where it was like, you know, at the end of the month, I was like, well, cool. 
I still don't have enough money to survive or to to do what I want to do or actually kind of build up any sort of nest egg. Like that. So it it did become the reality set in was like this was this was a great job, but it wasn't the job that was going to take me anywhere. And I think that. You know, maybe it's maybe it was the industry in South Africa, the, the television industry in South Africa. And I think that's that's journalism, car journalism yeah. as a whole. Like you I get so. to enjoy this massive lifestyle, yeah. drive these fancy cars, yeah. go to fancy places in the world, like you say. Yeah. But at the end of the day, yeah. and then what makes it yeah, what what kind of makes it more difficult to deal with is you look at what happens overseas, yeah, and how these guys run. You know, I mean, I, I heard a, a a story that Top Gear, when in its heyday. Top Gear got more money per episode than our TV got got for a whole season. Ooh. So yeah, that was kind of then. Then you're dealing with that and going, well, why is that the case? And it kind of doesn't sit well. So yeah, eventually it got to the point where, and I think also creatively, after doing it for ten years, you know, week in and week out, eventually you kind of start getting weary of like, what can you say about this car? What what approach can you tell? What story can you tell about this car? On top of the stress of you know not earning enough money, and that was the unfortunate uh, kind of end of my motoring career on that side. But that's interesting because for me, it's the same in any career. You take tennis players. A guy like Novak Djokovic is earning tens and tens of millions mm. of dollars a year. But interesting, how many tennis players in the world, out of a sport that is broadcast to billions, can earn a living from the sport? Mm. What would you imagine it is? It's it's a tiny fragment. And you're absolutely right. It doesn't matter what industry it is. Novak Djokovic is making billions. Mm -hmm. oh, no, no, billions of rands. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the, the number 120th ranked player in the world is battling to survive. Yeah. He's not even covering, he's losing money. Yeah. So the prize money that he wins versus his hotel expenses, because that's mm. not sponsored. Travel you know, knows. Novak Djokovic, everywhere he goes, I don't think that man would have paid for a meal in his life. Ah, oh, Mr. Djokovic, yeah. Mr. Federer, <laughs> Mr. Nadal. Yeah. But it's just interesting. And the point is, it doesn't matter what industry, car industry, fantastic. There's always going to be the Matt Watsons and the Jeremy Clarksons, mm. and then there's going to be thousands, literally thousands, yeah. that are not on that level. Yeah. Did you forget my name there? <laughs> and you mentioned Jeremy Clarkson and Matt I Watson. Said, I said, and then, then there's thousands that are not on that level, and then you get the stratospheric level, Mr. Oh, Masuku. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm glad my, my lessons have, have turned out so well. Yeah, they have, they yeah. have. So we, we told the story, I mean, what Spike's referring to there, um, if you haven't listened to that episode in the podcast, we basic I told the story of how Spike and I met. Um, and if you've missed it, he was my lecturer at some point. So he he was my lecturer slash the guy on TV reviewing cars, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Slash Mr. Ballantyne. Slash Mr. Ballantyne. Yeah. And yeah. he taught me a lot. Yeah. He taught me a lot. So essentially Google Goo fanboy me, fanboy me for <laughs> no, I did actually. <laughs> that was crazy. Okay, so you've obviously driven a lot of cars. Yeah. I mean, I've driven a lot of cars now, but mm. I mean, you probably way more. I've I've worked out at when I when I when my podcast ended, uh, 2021, I think it was. Mm. I worked out. I went back because I archive everything because I'm mm. OCD like that, and I kind of worked out how many cars I drove per year and how long. It, and I think I've driven, I've test driven probably 1,100 cars. I used 11 to do that. Yeah, 1,100. Mm. That's insane. Yeah, it's a yeah. lot. I'm lot gonna of ask cars. you this question again. I asked you the question when we first met. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, donkey years ago. Yeah, yeah. What 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 what's the best car you've driven? That, that's the first, the first question I asked. The, the by first the question you guys know. Any when people when people meet you, they go, oh no, what's the best car? Yeah, it's yeah. the first question yeah. anybody asks. Yeah. So and I, I don't have an answer I, 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 because it's it's a thing. Of, it's a contextual thing. So I remember. So gone. I don't know if I if I'd driven this car by the time I'd met you. Yeah. But the best car, ultimately, by the time I'd, I'd finished, the best car I'd driven was a Ferrari four five eight Berlinetta. That was that technically was the best car I ever drove. It felt amazing. It sounded great. It looked amazing. It went. We drove it on Frontier Pass. Uh, it was incredible. Mm. But I don't think I'd ever own a Ferrari because I'm not a Ferrari guy. Mm. Um, you know, the other cars that I've driven that I've that I've you know the thing that I always enjoyed about cars was the cars that surprised you the most. So you know, like the Volkswagen Up for me is one of the best cars ever. Why but, did they ever stop that? Why did they stop that? Why I did it know. not take off? Yeah, the Polo is a recipe mm. for success. Yeah, the Yaris has done superb. Mm. Why did the Up not do well? I don't. I think it's probably too small and just a culture thing. Like South Africans yeah. don't like small cars. Yeah, as much as that car was so well specced and really went well and was and you know for me looked great. I think it was just this thing of oh no, it's just this small car that small we don't want to be thing. seen in. We'd rather have a Polo. I love the Jaguar uh, F-Type V8 SVR. That was phenomenal. Uh, Porsche Cayman GT4 was the last test car I ever had and one of the best cars I've ever driven. So yeah, okay, so you've driven quite a few since we've spoken because 
The answer that you gave me back then was the Mercedes Benz. Is it the SLS? Not an easy car to forget a, that yeah, one. <laughs> yeah, no, and also almost a car almost crashed. But really? uh, tell us more. <laughs> I we we did the launch at Kyle Army, and it was it was early in the morning. It was cold, um, and I got in the car, and and the the initial run was with the instructor in the driver's or in the passenger seat, and the driver select modes are in the center console. Um, and it's if you you know if you don't if you're not familiar with it it's it's kind of like normal driving then it's sport then it's sport plus then it's race and it's and insane then, then it's like are you crazy <laughs> and, then, and the last one is like okay you're gonna die yeah where it just switches everything off so I got in the car um, into the driver's seat and I reached over and I swapped it I switched it from from normal to sport because that kind of standard procedure because we were on track and I didn't want to have everything let go all at once so like I wanted a bit of ABS and a bit of traction control but a little bit relaxed. And then I was talking to the cameraman and then I think what happened is that the instructor got in and also clicked it over. But I ah. think he also thought it was in normal and he clicked oh. it over to, to the next setting down, ah. which relaxed things even more. Yeah. And then we went out and um, it was it was cold. The track was cold. The car was cold. The tires were cold. Everything was cold. And I booted it a little bit too early into the one corner and the thing just swapped. And I ended up about a meter and a half from the barrier. But not even joking with you. How was that experience? It was Do you remember it yeah. to this day? Yeah. If ever you've lost a car, I can promise you, I remember every single time I've had a near incident in mm, a car. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You drive Quattro. I thought you were going to diss him for driving a real wheel drive car. <laughs> you should have been in a Quattro, man. It's amazing that you talk about that. Mm -hmm. So if you know the Linksfield off ramp, mm -hmm. if you're coming from Joburg, yep. traveling towards Germiston, yep. take the Linksfield off ramp. It's a sharp right. Exactly that. It had been raining. Audi R8 V10 Quattro, mm. you can't uh, can't make this car step out of line. Mm. Go around the corner. I'm in a hurry. Floored it. Absolutely wanted to swap. Yeah, but it sticks with me yeah. forever yeah. because yeah. there's a feeling like. I've lost Over, it. Yeah. I've yeah. lost it. Over. Yeah. And then you're so proud when you haven't properly lost it. <laughs> and then you hope somebody videotaped it. Yeah, yeah. But oh, just something about the way you two met. And this mm. is something, an aside, you haven't a clue what I'm about to say. I always say in life, everything you do will come back to reward you or come back to punish you. And every single day, Gugu, Spike, I don't know if you agree with me, you are being judged. Here's a gentleman today, and I say it respectfully, you're equal. Ten years ago, he was you saw he was your superior because he was your lecturer, but obviously made an impression. Here is an approachable guy. Here's a guy I can relate to. Ten years later, look how it helps you. And if I could say to anybody in our audience, because often I get asked, what advice would you give to anybody starting in business? Mm. Just make sure you realize that everything you do, positively or negatively, you are being judged, and it will come back mm. to reward you or punish you. So well done, Spike. If it wasn't for you being such a good guy, we wouldn't <laughs> have this uh, podcast. <laughs> and, and you're, you're absolutely right. I was actually thinking about this not so long ago, is that it really doesn't take a lot of time or a lot of effort if someone approaches you for mm. advice. It takes, it takes, and the thing is, this this is something I learned really early on and it's something that I've, I've kind of managed, I've always done whatever I can to help that advice. Um, you know, if, before motoring, I was in radio. Before, in, before radio, I was a sound engineer uh, at a studio. And, you know, those positions, I got into, I got into sound engineering because of a family connection and the guy who said, okay, fine, yeah, just come to my studio and you can hang around for a week. And I worked there for three years in the end. And, you know, whenever somebody approached me back then to say, well, how do I get into a studio? You're like, give them as much time as they need. 100%. Give them as much advice they want. Because I was once in that position. I was once in Google's position where I wanted to be on TV. And I, I mean, I didn't have anyone to approach, but I always say that if someone approaches you, it takes very little effort to give it some guidance. And it might be, a 10 minute conversation, it might be an hour long coffee, it might turn out to be something like Google and I have got where, you know, years later, we're still in oh, contact, we're still in friends, we're still friends. And, you know, there's, there's massive benefit for both of us. So just always take the time. Well, think about it in context. Somebody's asking you for advice. There can be a number of reasons. They look up to you because you're older. They look up to you because of your perceived position on radio, on mm. TV, a knowledgeable individual. What a privilege. I'm here. You're asking me for advice. Thank you. I'm humbled that you see me as somebody who can guide you. Yeah. And we're all talking the same thing. Yeah. Somebody asks you for advice. Just remember, they're doing you a favor. You're not doing them a yeah. favor. Agreed. What can what can I answer for you, gentlemen, <laughs> right now? It's my, it's my pleasure. The wealth of knowledge. You. <laughs> Look, uh, my next question to you was going to be, what, what made you give me the time of day? But I think you've answered that. Yeah, yeah. Because, it, because it costs nothing. Yeah. But you gave me more than the time of day, Spike, if I remember correctly. I think the, the thing is, you, you'll always, 
you know, I've met people who have wanted to get into radio or motoring or, or mm. podcast or whatever, and they'll come to you and go, well, how do I do it? And you kind of have an initial conversation and you can kind of gauge from that whether they're serious or not. I think a lot of people, particularly in the motoring space, don't realize actually it's quite a lot of hard work to get anywhere. Uh, you know, you can't just rock up and drive a car and say, oh, this is really cool and I love a V8 or whatever. It's not it's not what it's about. And I think the difference is that when you 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 do meet those people and you recognize that there's, there's you know, there's a willingness to learn and there's a willingness to put in the effort. It's not like I said to you, well, fine, thanks very much. I said to you, go, go write me a script. Yeah, you did. And and you wrote me a script. Granted, it was terrible. Yeah, But the was. point is you wrote it. You put in the effort. No need for editing on this particular <laughs> podcast. <laughs> but that's the point is you wrote it. And mm. from there, it's like, cool, okay, this guy's serious. And well then done. feedback. And then, okay. And then, you know, then it developed from there. Looking to buy a new or used car? Visit changecars.co.za. So you've been in the industry for many, many years. Um, how has the industry for you evolved? I mean, you're not actively in the industry now, but mm. you know what's going on. Yeah, I think the the obvious one is the the obvious one there is the rise of the influencer, Oof. Um, which I know is a touchy a subject for some people in the room. Um, but the, I saw that towards the end of my kind of stint in, in motoring is that um, you know the manufacturers got to a point where all they really wanted was eyeballs, mm. they didn't really care about the the kind of depth of analysis or, or kind of the, the story that got told. They just wanted to make sure that their latest car was seen, you know, on so-and-so's feed. Um, so I think that for me is, is the biggest change. Um, mm. And I, it kind of, it was driven home to me, excuse the pun, on a, on the Mustang launch, which I went on in, in Cape Town. And we were hosted by Ford at, at the Bantry Bay Hotel. And we were in TV and the TV a component of it, uh, very often got put with the, what was called the lifestyle guys. So not the serious car magazine, you know, guys from change cars, all things motoring, not those guys. Uh, and so we got to hang out with influencers and I saw um, one of the posts that the influencers put out there that said, hanging out on Camps Bay, but she was in a bikini, we hanging on, on Camps Bay beach on the Ford launch. And I was like, well, how is Ford happy with this? Because she's not talking about the car. There's no photos of the cars. There's no, there's no information, but it was a changing landscape. And I think that was, I saw the start of that and I kind of realized, okay, this is things are, things are going to be different. That's the one thing. And the other thing is, is now this kind of very um, real focus on tech and kind of moving over. And we've discussed it in a previous episode. Oh. It's moved away from this kind of hardcore performance and more, it's, it's more about how, how it helps your life rather than, you know, how it makes you feel. Okay, so I'm going to put you guys both on the spot here, if you don't mind. Can I go second, please? You're going first, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> Spike mentioned that manufacturers are now looking just for eyeballs. That's all that matters. Mm. Um, influencers, eyeballs, who sees the post, how many people see the post. Do you think there is value there? Because I can sit in my little, in my mother's bed, uh, back room or in, in a room in my mother's house on my phone on Instagram and dream and like and like and like and but millions of me's out there doesn't mean I'm, I can afford the car sure. or mm -hmm. I'm going to buy the car. What's your take on that? So the interesting thing is whether I agree with it or disagree with it, I love people who are knowledgeable. Mm. I love people who have a history and they can write what I will uh, place value on. Mm. However, not everybody's like that. Mm. Is there value in influencers? Not even a question. How many likes? 23,456 likes. Job done. Doesn't matter what that person said. Hanging out on Camps Bay Beach, looking cool, whatever the case may be. I don't even know who the person is. If she got likes, as far as the manufacturer mm. goes, am I wrong, Google? Yeah, yeah. They are, they are yeah, happy. Yeah. However, do I agree with it? Not necessarily. Mm. Go get a car magazine from the 70s, the 80s, or the 90s and read the test. You read it, you could feel it, you could live it. They spoke about the feel on the road, the changes of the gears, the braking distances. Who cares about what the braking distance is on a modern car? They don't even talk about it. Mm. A modern journalist won't tell you the car stops from 127 meters, whereas two years ago it stopped in 29. No. no. Yourself, what do you feel? I agree with you. I think that it's it's kind of irrelevant what we think because it it, it works for the manufacturers on some mm. level. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. You think it converts to ROI? I, that's the big question. And then you got to look at it from the point of view: what is what is marketing, and how much of marketing actually converts to actual ROI? Um, and one of the manufacturers who I, I won't mean, I won't name, but said to me, I had this conversation with him, and he said to me, you know, "The thing is, what letter does it start with? It I... starts with a Q." 
You. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, I, I want to try and guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he said to me, yeah, he, he, he also doesn't agree with the influencer model. But he said he just looks at it as billboards. That's all it is. Is that, you know, you don't get much from a billboard other than, wow, look at that car. Mm. But that car's top becomes top of mind if you see it enough or you get to know about that car or you get to know about that brand because you're seeing it all the time. And that was his recipe. He was like, you know what, I'll take it because that's where the market is. That's what people want to see. And he won't put much stock in their opinions. He'll just use them for their ability to get eyeballs on his product and then rely on car magazine, all things motoring, all the other kind of Thank you. you know journalistic approach uh, journalistic uh, outlets to give that approach to to the product. that's an incredible analogy like he just looks at it as a billboard yeah. very very clever it's yeah. that way and yeah. it, it, it puts it all into perspective in yeah. a way and influencers listening i do apologize um i see your <laughs> your role and value in this entire food chain <laughs> your thoughts? Now, Our thoughts? one of the things about a capitalist world mm. is if you can make it work and you deliver results you're going to get your reward. Mm. Yeah. The reason influencers are around is because they're delivering something for somebody. They've got the following. Well done to them. You mm. know, 20 years ago, a typist would have said, oh, my word, how can you have this technology that does away with a typist? How many typists do you get today? Never no. heard of one. Yeah. 100%. Doesn't yeah. even exist. Yeah. So the world changes if you can make it work as an influencer, mm. hats off to you and yeah. well done. There's a, there's a place in the sun for everybody. Yeah. And just my final thought on it is that if, you know, if a manufacturer doesn't go to the influencer route, they're losing out because everybody else is. So you mm. kind of damned if you do and damned if you get, you have to, uh, because you know, your competitors are getting the traction that you're not getting by not including influencers in what you're doing. For sure. And with that, we have come to the end of yet another episode of the Keep It or Change Cars podcast. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. The shoot? Yes, Spike. It's been superb Spike. having you. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, James. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. We've reached the end of yet another episode of the Keep It or Change Cars podcast. Gents, thank you so much for your time, the banter, the input, everything. Well appreciated. And would love to get you in on the conversation as well. It's podcast at changecars.co.za. Email us. Or if you just need advice, that's what we're here for. And if you're looking for a new or used car or a bike or a boat, get onto the Change Cars website. Or if you want to sell your car, if you've got a vehicle that's got 15,000 kilometers or less annually, we'd love to buy it from you. Get in touch with us and I promise you, we'll give you a good deal. For South Africa's best motoring content, catch all things motoring on DSTV channel 189 and on YouTube. New episodes every week.